Okay. Thank you. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Henry Wang. So I'm currently a fifth year PhD at uh, Professor Heinz lab. So today uh, we are going to firstly introduce some basics of uh, quantum computing because before knowing some those like basic uh, mathematics, um, you cannot understand like fully understand what is the quantum machine learning uh, trying to do. So uh, in today's lecture, we will have four parts. And uh, for first part, we introduce the single qubit uh, state and also the single qubit gates. And then we extend to multiple qubits. And then we introduce uh, mo uh, even more qubits and gates, which compose a quantum circuit. And finally, we introduce the current uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum era. Uh, error and then the compilation problem for the current NISC devices. So, um, so first of all, we know that uh, recently uh, the quantum computing uh, devices is uh, undergoing a very really fast progress. So we have uh, different technologies, and then just several days ago, IBM just released the, the newest uh, 433 qubits. So actually, the number of qubits is going up uh, exponentially. Uh, recently, and that's not just for the superconducting, but also for several other techniques, uh, technologies such as neutral item, uh, photonics, uh, quantum computers. So the middle one is the Google uh, Sycamore uh, quantum computer, which proved the quantum advantage, and this one is from the uh, 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 Ion from the IonQ company. Uh, the number of qubits actually uh, recently increased exponentially over time. So that's um, it's more like a Moore's law in the quantum computing, but the computing power is not just linear to the qubit number, but it's also exponential to the qubit member. So that is a double exponential increase of the computing power. So uh, before uh, getting into the quantum algorithms or the circuits, let's just have a look at what is a quantum bit. So the quantum bit is the basic component of a quantum system. So um, we call that a quantum bit or a qubit. So to, uh, to describe the state of this uh, qubits, we need to use a state vector. So just imagine what it, uh, imagine classical system with a car here. So the car can be in different locations uh, on this uh, horizontal line. And if, you want, if we want to describe the state of this classical system, what we can do, we can use a variable x here to uh, describe four as the location of the car, right? So, um, Besides this, this method, what, what other method we can use or mathematical tools we can use to describe the system um, uh, state? So here we can use a one-hot vector, right? We just use them as the probability of the car being at different locations. So because we know the car is a classical, uh, uh, classical thing, so it must be just um, at one location. It's not, it, not, it, is not, uh, it is not going to have different locations at the same time. So this method is inefficient. Um, in terms of the memory usage, because previously we just have we just need to use one number, but now we need to use a vector, a one-hot vector to describe the whole system. But actually, this method is pretty um, useful in the quantum computing state, because in the quantum we can have multiple different locations and the su and the superposition of them. So here we can have a look at the notation of the qubit. So for classical, we can easily use either a zero or one to describe the state of one bit. And then in the quantum, we are, we are actually using the orthogonal vectors to describe the state of a quantum uh, bit. So here, the orthogonal vectors are no, uh, notated by the bracket notation or the Dirac notation. So here we can see um, the zero here is represented by the one hot one zero vector, and one state is, is zero one. And then for more complex states, we can actually use, um, use not just the uh, in integers here, or just zero or one here to describe state. We actually can use some comp complex numbers uh, inside this vector. So um, here we can see that uh, how can we write this state in terms of the combination of two basis state? So we know the basis are the one, are the zeros, and also the one, right? So actually, it's pretty easy because we can decompose that to the linear combination of the zero state and the one state. So here we call a superposition of two basis state as a linear combination of the two states. And then uh, you may ask, when we have the quantum, quantum bit, how can we access the information inside quantum bit, right? Unfortunately, we cannot directly uh, get 
the information here uh, stored in the vector, but instead we can do some measurement to the quantum bit to obtain a classical bit. So here it delineate, uh, delineate the uh, principle of the measurement. So here uh, the measurement process is actually a stochastic process. So for example, we prepare the qubit and then we measure for 100 times. And uh, based on the uh, inherent state of the quantum bit, we actually can uh, either obtain a zero or one. So the probability to obtain a zero or one is determined by this uh, equation. So actually the probability to get x, here x can be zero or one. It, it, it's, uh, uh, it's bracket notation here. So actually it's a, uh, a row vector and a column vector doing um, a dot production. And then we compute the magnitude and then take the square. So later on, we'll give an example of the probability computation here. Here, we just have a look at the, uh, notate, uh, the strange notation here. So there is, a, um, <coughs> there is a line on the left, and then there's another line on the right. So if the, uh, for the column vector here, we are actually using the cat notation. So here we can see the uh, alpha or a here, it is a column vector. And for the row vectors, we are using the bra notation, so which is a conjugate transpose of the column vector. Okay, question. Do you always have to use this for what does it mean to have a complex? Yeah, that's a great question. So later on, we'll, uh, it's not necessary to use complex numbers to represent. We actually, for single qubit, we can just use uh, real numbers. So we'll later um, describe how to reduce to, to real numbers. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so here we can see, like, uh, see that uh, the x here can be uh, arbitrary state. So for example, if you want to measure uh, the q0 in the zero state, so that means uh, what is the probability that we measure a classical zero from the q here? So uh, remember that the q0 previously we introduced is the superposition between the zero and the one in this state, right? And then we know the, the vector representation for this q, q0. And then we just do the uh, dot production between this vector and the zero vector. So here we can see that the dot, dot production result is one over square root of two. And then we take the, uh, take the um, uh, here we take a square here, and then we get the one over two, which is the probability that we measure uh, zero from this q0. Okay, so you can imagine that if we here rep uh, replace the zero uh, with the one vector, that will still be one over, uh, that would be i over square root two here. So, but the magnitude of the i over two is the same as one over two. So that means that there, there is still 50% uh, of probability to measure uh, one from this qubit. Okay, so, sorry. Um, which one? Oh, yeah, the psi here is the state. So psi here is a Q0 state. Psi is just the target state. And x is the, is the measurement basis. For example, we can have zero or one because we want to measure this psi to either zero or one. So we do the dot production between the zero and the, and the state. So this is the equation of the, uh, the usage is that, for example, you have a, um, you want to know what is the uh, state of a qubit. You just do 1,000 times of the measurement and say you get ni uh, 900 of them as one and 100 of them as zero. So you can deduct what is the initial state of the qubit according to this, pro to this uh, equation. So you are estimating, uh, we're estimating the, the psi here. For example, the unknown state, we can just uh, get some information from the qubits by measurement, right? Mm -hmm. And the measurement is, is uh, the probability we can uh, deduct back to what is the psi looks like. Yeah. So actually, uh, getting the state of a qubit from the measurement result is called the tomography. So that is a, a standard process to, 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 to obtain the original state from the measurement outcomes. Okay, so uh, as we know, the probability of measuring zero or one should, should add up to one, right? So, and also if we just, just measure a state in itself, then that should be one because the dot production here, just uh, it is in its original state. So there should be 100% as a state. So in that case, if we uh, uh, use this uh, representation and then we take this uh, psi, uh, psi here, 
applied here to this uh, equation, and then we can detect that the alpha square plus uh, beta square should be one. So that is one constraint for the complex number um, values here. And then later we will use this to, uh, to reduce the from complex number to the real number to describe the single qubit system. Okay. So besides using the one zero here, we, we, we actually can also use others, other bases. So basically the quantum state is, you can consider as a vector, and then you can project the vector to arbitrary state, as long as they are like auto, uh, also normal basis, basis, right? So zero and one is just one of them. There are infinite pairs of orthogonal bases. And uh, when we do the measurement, the state will, will be projected to either one of them. Okay. So there will be a, a, a global phase for the state. For example, if we have uh, I1 here, so what is the measurement outcome uh, for, for, uh, for this state on the one, uh, one bit, right, the, the, the say one. So here we can see that if we do, the, uh, do this uh, equation, uh, computation, and then the magnitude of, of I is just one. So there will be no effect on the final measurement outcome. So that means, the I1 and 1 here are actually equivalent in all ways that are physically re relevant. So that means the global phase here is actually, uh, we cannot detect that. So in that case, uh, the uh, two state with the global phase is actually uh, identical from, from our point of view. Okay, so here comes to a very interesting part, which is called observer effect. So that means when we do the measurement of the qubits, the qubits will collapse. So previously, that is a Q, Q0 with the superposition of one and zero, right? But after we do the measurement, so say if we get zero, and then the state itself, we also collapse to zero state. So that means we cannot, um, we cannot like reuse the state after we observe this state, right? So that's, that's why typically all the quantum circuits, uh, the measurement are performed at the end of the computation. So otherwise the information in between will be lost. When we, do the measure, when we do the observation of the system, we, we cannot uh, further keep, this, keep the information. So uh, when we do, do the measurement of multiple qubits, so for example, 10 qubits, we are finally get a series of classical bits, just like uh, measuring one bit. Okay, so here um, is a very famous um, story of the Schrodinger's cat. So why the cat can be in a superposition of the live or die? So that, uh, that is because uh, uh, it, uh, remember that we can create a superposition between the zero and one. So uh, the probability of the uh, of this uh, laser like uh, e emit a, like a, a photon here to this uh, switch is also a superposition between zero and one. So if it is uh, emitting one photon, then in that case the poison here will kill the cat. But if there is not, uh, the cat will keep alive. So because this one is a superposition, so that means the switch is also a superposition. Before we do any measurement or observation, that's a superposition. We don't know what is exactly the state. And that means the, the, the poison here is also in a superposition of like a brick, brick bottle or uh, like a not brick bottle. And that, in that case, the cat is also, we cannot know whether it's live or, uh, living or die. Yeah. Okay, so uh, here uh, comes to the question. So how many, three variables are there in a state. So here we know the, the Q here is alpha zero and uh, plus beta one. Um, and then we, we know that both of them are complex numbers. But actually we can uh, reduce that. Uh, for example, here we can take out a global phase. And in that case, um, the exponential term, the EI phi here is, uh, can be, uh, can be uh, removed. So in that case, there are only three uh, variables for the real number here three real number variables here to describe the system, uh, alpha, beta, and phi here. And another uh, thing we just detect is the alpha square plus beta squ square, that should be one. So that add, uh, add up another constraint on the, on the values. So in that case, we can just assume that alpha is cosine theta over two and beta is sine theta over two because that will satisfy that the uh, sum of the square will be one, right? And then, in that case, we just have two free variables, beta and, and phi. So in that case, uh, as summary, there are only two free variables for one state. And here, actually, we can consider the theta and phi as the spherical coordinate of a sphere, which we call a block sphere. 
So here we can see the theta is actually the degree between this vector to the uh, to the uh, z z axis, and phi here is the degree between the vector and the x axis, right? So in that case, um, we can have like arbitrary state, and then each state will be represent as a unique dot on this rock sphere. So that is a sphere representation of the Jupiter state. Uh, one is the state one. Uh, remember that previously we introduced the, the basis state one and basis state zero. They're actually like two poles of the block sphere. Yeah, here if you see like if theta is uh, is uh, is pi, and then uh, phi here is zero, and then we can get one, right? Oh, okay. I thought yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, that is pretty in intuitive, but it's, it's not that intuitive when we come to multiple qubits because it's very difficult to have a sphere for multiple qubits. Okay, so uh, here we have like, uh, we, we introduced the state. And what, what is interesting is that how can we do some manipulation of the state with some quantum gates? So here we, uh, we, one thing we should know is that all of the quantum gates are reversible. So the reversible concept is not that important in a classical compu computer because um, because the information can be observed or duplicated for many times. So for example, in the uh, CMOS, we have like different gates, like the, um, like the XOR gate, that's not, that's not reversible. And also like um, uh, uh, some other gates, if the gates just have one output from two, two inputs, that's definitely not reversible because we cannot determine what is input from just one output, right? But what is the uh, example of the reversible gate? So here we, can, we know the, the reverter, right? So the not gate. So here we have the not gate as a reversible gate because it's just apply on a single qubit. And if the result is zero, we know the previous one is, uh, previous result, previous input is one, right? So here is a, a question. What is the simplest reversible gate in a, in a classical computation? Yes, exactly, it's identical. So you just, you just do nothing. And it is, it's of course, that ident identity matrix. So it's the simplest reversible case is just the identity gate. Um, so for all the reversible case, they can, re they can be represented as matrices or the rotations around the block sphere we just introduced. So here we can see several uh, very representative uh, gates. So the X gate is actually implementing a, a reverse operation. So that means, um, say, if we have the zero as input, which is represented by the one zero state, state. And then we apply this X gate to this state, and then we can obtain another vector, which is zero one. So we know that zero one represents the one state. So that is aligned with our intuition in the classical computation where we apply a not gate to zero that will give us one, right? So uh, there are also other gates, uh, like uh, there are actually uh, in total three, uh, four like poly gates, the, the identity, Function just mentioned, and also the x, y, z. So for the y gates and z gates, they have this, uh, this, uh, this forms. And for, yeah, question. Are these related to the x, y, z actually? Yeah, they are related to the x, y, z. So actually, the gates here, uh, we will introduce the, the what is the gate, uh, what is the x, y, z gate relation to the to the block sphere actually? Yeah, right. So uh, we can see that. Uh, uh, just a quick question. What happens when we apply this Z gate to the zero state? So remember, Z gate is one, zero, and zero minus one. And then if we do the matrix modification to the, to the one, zero, that will be the same, right? The result will not be changed. And if you apply that to the one state, that will, be, that will give a minus one. But remember, previously we, we introduced the global phase. So the minus one here is actually indistinguishable with the one state, right? So that means when we apply the Z gates, actually nothing happens. Zero is still zero, one is still one. So that is because the zero and one states are the eigenstates of the Z matrix, right? And then the commutation forms by this uh, zero and one state are actually called the Z basis, which is actually on the block sphere here. Um, we can see the zero and one is the Z basis, right? And then we can see there are also X basis, which is the two poles um, intersect with the X axis. This is the, uh, the, the plus here, the plus state. And the one in the, in the, in the back uh, behind, 
like in the back is the uh, minus state. And then we also had a y basis, uh, like uh, uh, perpendicular to both the x and also the z, which is here. So the, the left one is called the left state, and the right one is the right state. So that's how this, um, the basis is correlated to the, to the block sphere. Yeah, question. So you may first take the same approach as applying it to the Pythagorean diagonal matrix. Why do you use that with the one that was just diagonal matrix? Yeah, because that will have some different effect when we have multiple gates. Yeah. Just for a single one, that, that's the same. But for multi, multiple ones, that will create a relative gate, relative phase between different qubits, then that's, that matters. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, so the, um, the reason why it's reversible is that all the operations we're we are applying is a unitary matrix. So the matrix define operation, and operation defined by unitary matrix is inherently irreversible. And if, if we want to uh, uh, do some computation like a, uh, like a X, X or gate, so that can be that can have a reversible version. Uh, for example, we just duplicate the first bit. We opt output both the first one and also the XOR one. Then we can convert a non-reversible gate to a reversible one. Yeah. Right. So in that case, all the classical computation can be done on quantum computer. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand how they're related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, X is a matrix, and the uh, two bases, um, like two bases here, oh, sorry, two bases here are the, uh, actually the eigenstate of this matrix. So the eigenstate, yeah, uh, the plus means the state at this point, and, and minus means the state at this point. So that's just two, two states, because one state you can consider as one point on the block sphere. Right, and the, and the plus state is the front point, minus state is the, the back point, and those two points uh, form two vectors as this and this one, and those two vectors are the eigenstates of the X matrix. So, so in that case, when we apply the X, when we apply the X gate to these two states, nothing will happen. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, so. Um, and then we can have a look at some other uh, fancy gates like the Heimark gates. So the Heimark gates is actually very important for the quantum computing because when we input a classical state, for example, the zero or one, and if we apply a Heimark, Heimark gate here, that, that will create a superposition which we, we are pursuing, right? So for example, the H here, we apply to the zero state that will create the plus state. That is a superposition between zero and one. And uh, again, for the one state here, it will create a minus state. And also we have some other single qubit gates. Some of them contains parameters. For example, this one is the phase gate, which contain the EI phi as the uh, one of the parameters. So we can actually change the parameter here to, uh, to apply different kinds of uh, effect using this gate. And also again, we have some other gates uh, like the S and S dagger. Okay, so finally, we are going to introduce this U gate, which is a universal, or it contains all possible gates. That means all of the single qubit gates you can represent with these three, uh, three uh, uh, rotation angles. For example, the H gate can be represented as U uh, pi over 2, 0 pi, and P gate is just a U 0, 0 lambda. Okay, so we finally finished uh, the most uh, difficult part, which is the single qubit. And then we just naturally extend that to multiple quantum bits. So uh, first of all, we know that for two bits, we can have four possible uh, states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So just use the knowledge we just learned. For the two quantum bits, let's naturally have a superposition between those four different states, right? So that is uh, delineated here. So we can also use a vector to represent this. So question here, how many how many entries here if we have n bits? So here with two bits, we have four. One bit, we have two. Yes, yes. So 
here we can see for the for the uh, n qubits here, we actually can have two to the power of n uh, magnitude in the state vector. Like three qubits, we have eight. Two qubits, have two. And so that's the part of the reason why it is very difficult to simulate the quantum computation on classical computer because the memory will easily overflow. Say you, you, you want to simulate 100 qubits that requires uh, 10 to the power of 30 around like uh, uh, numbers to, to store. So that's uh, almost uh, impossible even for the, 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 the most powerful supercomputer. Com okay, so another examples on the measurement on, and also the uh, normalization principles also apply to multiple qubits. It's a natural extension from a single qubit. Okay, so here we can have a, uh, have a look at example. So here we have the H gate applied to both quantum, uh, quantum bit zero, qubit zero, qubit one, and qubit two. So we can represent this whole state because we, we, we know that when we apply H to the, to the zero state, we have the plus state. So that's basically just plus, plus, plus. And then represented by the same vector that is one over square root of eight of, eight, of all one here. And again, we, we want to have a look at what happens when we apply just single qubit gate to multi-qubit system, right? Before, before introducing multi-qubit gates, we just have a look at single qubit gates. So uh, this, uh, this is a um, re uh, reminder of the previous like X gate. And then when we apply, when we have a separate gate on two qubits. So for example, the X on the Q1 and the H on the Q0. So that is simply a chronicler or chronicler product between the matrix of those two, uh, two matrices. Here we can compute the joint matrix of those two gates. Or we can simply just uh, write that as 0, H, H0, which is a clear form. And again, if we are doing this uh, X gate on Q1 and nothing on the Q0, so that is actually a chronicler between X and the identity gate, right? And then we, can, we know that the overall uh, matrix representation of this gate is this uh, four by four matrix. Okay, so here comes to the most, maybe most important uh, two qubit gates or multi qubit gates in the, in the field of quantum computing, which is called C0 gate. So C0 is essentially doing, uh, contains two parts. One is a control qubit, another is a target qubit. So Q0 here is a control qubit and Q1 is target. So if the Q0 is zero, then there nothing happens on the Q1. But if the Q0 is one, we apply a NOT gate on the Q1. So that's the, how we consider this as the, uh, this is a true, true table for this gate. And here, if we represent as, as the uh, matrix representation, we can see uh, column-wise, that's the output, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And uh, row-wise, that's input from 0, 0 to 1, 1. So we can see the one here, that means when we input 1, 1, the output will be 1, 0. Okay, so um, the C0, when we consider this state vector, so actually it's, it is performing a swap of the 1, 1 state and 0, 1 state here. So here we can see 0, 1 and 1, 1, 1 here. But after C0, it's actually the value in these two locations will be swapped. Okay, so here comes to a very interesting part of the uh, one of the two most interesting parts in the quantum, one is the, uh, one is the superposition we just introduced previously. Another is called entanglement. So how we can create an entanglement between two qubits, right? So here is how. Firstly, we apply a H gate on the Q0, which, which is, uh, convert this whole system to the zero class state, which can be represented as the zero, zero plus zero, one, right? And then we can apply this C0 gate we just introduced to this system. And what happens to that? We can see that the one for, for this state, um, for the zero part of the plus, that will not change. But for the one part of the plus, that will also reverse the first zero, right? So that means the resulting state is a super, is an entanglement uh, or superposition between zero, zero and one, one. So the interesting part of this is that um, say we do the measurement of Q0 and then we get a classical zero. So what happens to quantum uh, qubit one? Because all the, all the probabilities are in either both zero or both one, right? So in that case, when we do the measurement of Q1, we also obtain the same result of the Q0. So that is, uh, here we can see some simulation result. 
So all of the measurement, measurement outcomes uh, probabilities will be in the both zero or both one here. So that, that creates the spooky, act, spooky act, action at a distance. So that means even we separate those, those two qubits light years away, even two ends of the universe, and then we do the measurement of one qubit. So that will immediately have effect on another qubit because the result of the measurement will be, must be the same, right? So that means here, so if we separate them to very far away, and then we do the measurement of one of them, and then the, the state of two qubits must be the same, yeah. However, you may ask whether we can use that to commute, to do some communication, to send one bit information. Unfortunately, that's not possible because of the non-communication theorem. So here we can see, because of the measurement result is totally random, so we don't know ahead of time what will be the zero, what will be zero or one. So in that case, we cannot make some plan ahead, or we cannot let another side know what is the what 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 is information I want to convey. So first of all, the re result is random, and also like the measurement statistics of one bit is not affected by another one. Uh, it's not affected by the operation on another one. So that means we cannot share any information across this entanglement qubit. A little bit disappointing, right? But uh, for, the, uh, for the computation, we still use this entanglement uh, uh, heavily. Yeah. So another thing is called a uh, phase kick kickback. So uh, in, uh, because of the time, I will uh, skip this, uh, this development here. Um, so uh, here we introduce some more commonly used multi-qubit gates. For example, the CZ gates uh, that is just a controlled C uh, between those two qubits, which is uh, e uh, equivalent to the Hadamard gates and then C0 and Hadamard. And also we can apply this swap gate between the Q0 and Q1. So that is equivalent to three C0. So the swap, according to this, uh, the name, is just doing, some, doing the switch of the information between the two qubits. So after the swap, the information on Q1 will be on Q0 and the previous information Q0 will be on Q1. So that's why it's called a swap. swap. And again, we also have some uh, parameterized uh, multi-qubit gates. For example, here, the, the control, the rotation X, contains the theta here. So the parameterized gates are actually pretty important for different kinds of applications, including the quantum machine learning, because if we want the model to have some learning capacity, we need to have some tunable uh, parameters or tunable settings in the model. So the uh, so the um, parameterized gates provide the freedom that we can change the, the, the system setting, right? Okay, here we come to uh, section three, which is quantum circuit. So now we know the, the basis of, a, of the bits, and also we know the gates. So we, we can just con like, uh, make them uh, together, which is like uh, construct a quantum circuit. So here we can see that, uh, first of all, for some of the algorithms, we have the initialization or the recite of the initial, uh, initial qubits. For example, we can initialize to the zero state or some other state. And then we apply some quantum gates, like the Heidelberg gates, C0 gates, or any other gates you want to apply. And finally, we do the measurement. So the measurement process is uh, stochastic. So we, we need to prepare this state, the circuit for multiple times, and then mo measure multiple times to get a meaningful distribution. And then even after the measurement, uh, so for example, we do the measurement and then we have this uh, two lines, typically two lines as a convention means the classical information and one line means the quantum information. And then we can use this classical information to apply uh, a not gate. So that means when we do the measurement and the measurement outcome is one, we apply a X. If not, we, we don't apply this X. Okay, so we can have a look at a simple either circuit, which is doing the either using the quantum circuit. So the basic component is the C0 gate. So for example, if we do a X gate on the Q0, and then we do a, uh, do a C0 gate, so we construct the truth table. So we can see that the measurement outcome on Q1 here is actually, so if two zero here, the output is zero. Zero one is one, one zero is one. If two are one, then here the Q1 is still zero. So that is implementing an XOR of the two inputs, right? So, and then uh, we, uh, because we don't want to, um, because we don't want to like uh, measure the Q1 information. So here we just extend this circuit with uh, another quantum bit. So here, 
So basically, we just uh, doing the two x here, and then we have the c naught between q zero and q two, and q one and uh, q one and q two, and then we do the measurement. So for example, if we want to have, uh, we can have a computation here, maybe q one here one one, and then after x is zero zero, and then the result will be zero. If there is one, there's a zero one here, and then the result will be one, right? If both of them are zero, and we have two x gate, so the result will be still one. So that uh, satisfy the, the the half either uh, requirement. But there is also a, a q three here. So, um, so we we actually um, can compute the carry bit using the q three. So here, actually, if both of them, uh, if one of them um, is uh, is one, and then the the result should be uh, should be one. So if both of them is zero, the result should be uh, zero. So if we use this control control not, so the result will be uh, satisfy the the correctness for a carry bit. So this is just example for the uh, either circuit. So um, here I, I will use like two minutes to introduce. One algorithm, which uh, which uh, tells why uh, why we have this uh, parism. So imagine we have a black box that computes a function map from a single single bit to another single bit. So the computation is very just a input one and then output input zero output. So but the computation is very complicated, which takes one day. So so how can we know f x? We need to do two times of the execution. That takes two days, right? And then, so assume we only need to know whether fx is constant or balanced. That means when it's applied to zero or one, whether the result is the same. So again, we should we need to run two days to do the determination. But with a quantum circuit, we actually can can build a circuit which compute the fx using a quantum quantum machine. And then the intuition is that um, the uf is the, the the function to compute that. So when we do the uh, do the do the computation. We can input the the superposition between the zero and one. So for the second qubits, we can input this one, and for the first first qubit, we can input the uh, this uh, plus state, and then uh, we omit the computation here. But the final result is that here we can see uh, if f zero and f one are both um, both one or both zero, that means const, con, consi, uh, constant. We can immediately measure. Uh, this as the plus state, or if that is balanced, we can measure them as the minus state. So that means we, we only need to run for one day using the quantum machine to get the res get the answer for this question. Okay, so I think that's um, uh, the the last section is the next error, but uh, uh, basically it is uh, telling that the current current device is very noisy and the size is not uh, large enough. So we have to develop. Some of the algorithm and device uh, algorithm and hardware co-design methodologies to improve the power of the current devices. So uh, due to time limit, I will omit uh, the qubit mapping process. So uh, as a recap, today we introduced the single qubit states and gates, multi qubit state and gates, and also combine them get together as the quantum circuit and how to run the quantum circuit and do the compilation on this device. The next lecture we introduce the quantum machine learning. So uh, thank you very much for listening.